structure is your friend. Stop hiding behind being an artist for being unscheduled. From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. I'm Josh Steik, along here with Luke Aker. We have another amazing interview to bring you guys today. We but always first, have amazing interviews. Always. Well, I mean... Okay, we had one that we talked about one time that we didn't release. It was our only episode that we never released. And I actually regret... It's going to still haunt you to this day. It does. I regret not releasing it, but I more regret just not... Like, it's a great principle for everybody um, listening. It's like, you always got to stand up for what you truly think and what you truly believe in. Because in that show, we didn't stand up. For like, really, we were trying to be good interviewers and polite trying people. To be nice, yeah. we we're trying to be nice, polite hosts, and we should have stood up. And it probably would have been one of our most popular episodes, but because we were weak and we didn't really do our <laughs> job, it just ended up being a bad episode altogether. We didn't release it, so all our all our guests are phenomenal, but that one episode. Not to be mentioned. Well, before we introduce this week's guest, we would love it if you take a minute to subscribe to Stay Paid on Apple Podcasts. If you're not already subscribed and leave a review along with a comment to let us know how we're doing, whether or not you think we're weak or we're strong or we're in the middle. You know, we still need to... Yeah, I don't like the middle, though. That's like lukewarm. You don't like the middle. No, you can't be lukewarm. <laughs> You'd rather be weak. Yeah, hot or cold. <laughs> yeah, you either hate me or love me. This, I, don't, I don't want mediocre. Well, speaking of weeks, this week's featured interview or uh, featured uh, uh, review comes from Callie Err via Apple Podcast. They say, amazing five stars. I haven't made the entrepreneurial plunge yet, but I have started on the path. This podcast has a wealth of information for anyone who is in sales, even if they don't want to be an entrepreneur. So many gold nuggets. Sometimes they say things that I have to rewind multiple times because it's just too good not to hear twice. Love the podcast. Mm. Thank you, Callie, for leaving that yes, thank you. review on Apple Podcast. And today's guest, his name is Jeff Lerner. He is the CEO and founder of Entre Institute, where he's introduced over 50,000 students to his digital real estate concept, having gone from a broke jazz musician to producing over $50 million in online sales. Ooh. Jeff is now teaching others the secrets through his training courses, books, YouTube channel, and his popular podcast, Millionaire Secrets. Jeff, welcome to Stay Paid. I'm glad to be here, man. If you guys are going to help me stay paid. I'm, I'm, I'm in the right place. No, you're helping like. other people stay. We're interviewing you. <laughs> so oh. you help us. Dang. You mean I got to like serve others? Like, come on. It's a, it's a crazy <laughs> concept in today's world. It's like, ah, oh, oh, crazy, man. We're super excited to have you on the show and hear about your journey. I mean, literally being, I think I read in one of your bios, like broke 500,000 in debt to 50 million generated in sales, now 50,000 students. Take it just a few minutes and, you know, let the audience kind of know who you are, your journey, and what brought you here today. Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, this is the first interview I've ever given on AirPods. So I'm hoping, can you guys hear me well? We can hear you. Sounds great. You got the thumbs yeah, up from yeah. producer Ariel. Oh, that's sweet. hard. That's okay. hard to get. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try not to have it be the best moment of the show. Um, so... <laughs> I was indeed four hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars in debt, almost almost five hundred. Um, I got as close to five hundred as I could, and I, I fell five thousand short. Um, so that was at twenty-eight years old, twenty maybe twenty-nine when it actually officially converted into collectible debt. But um, and that was already after thirteen years as an entrepreneur. You, you mentioned mm. your your reviewer person who's not yet taken the plunge. Um, into entrepreneurship. I've never not taken the plunge into entrepreneurship. Mm. Literally when it was time to get a job, I, I got a job. My, my parents were like, yeah, you're 16, you know, maybe you start to be a productive member of society. I did it for three weeks and I was like, I love working, but the whole showing up at a certain time, being told what to do, being told what to wear, being told how to speak, having to do the bidding of people. I don't know well enough to know if I like them or not, but from what I can tell, I'm not sure I do like <laughs> that part. Wasn't so much for me. So I got myself fired after three weeks and, uh, I've been an entrepreneur ever since I, I immediately, I guess, uh, you know, went back to school and, uh, I guess my first, basically I had this epiphany, like Jeff, 
This is your life. You just got a three week sample of your life. So you're lucky because you get to try on, you got to try on your life and decide if you like the fit. And if you don't, I mean, this was like pre Zappos pre online, but basically I was like, I'm sending it back. Um, and, uh, I decided I'm going to become a musician. I'm going to drop out of school because school is a, is a path built on a construct and a, and a, a societal paradigm that holds no relevance for me because I've already decided that I reject it. Hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I literally explained that to my parents <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it was my first, it was my first uh, attempt at developing some salesmanship skills and I actually pulled it off and they were like, my parents have always been really laissez faire where it's like, and they were really successful uh, business people themselves. My dad was an uh, investment advisor and then later a, a full-on wealth manager. And my mom was an attorney, but she, she, you know, it was very independent. You know, you find your clients, you bill your hours, right? And they were like, listen, you make this choice, you're going to have to live with it. You want to be a high school dropout? Like, go look it up. And, and I, think, I think they had Google. Maybe it was like Yahoo or Alta Vista or something. I think it was like, askjeeves.com. <laughs> oh yeah. They're like, go ask Jeeves how, yeah. how it's going to work out dropping out of high school. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I was undaunted. I just knew that having a job was not for me. So I uh, became a musician, dropped out of school, started practicing. The, the other big problem is I, I was not actually a very good piano player. Like I had, you know, dabbled a little when I was younger, but I mean, I couldn't play like, you know, a basic song that like, Oh, he's pretty good. Like for Elise, right. Like I couldn't play that when I was 16 years old. And yet I was like, I'm going to be a professional piano player because pianists get the best gigs. You get to show up at rich people's houses and they already have a piano there. You get, you're a one man band. So you don't have to split the money with like a drummer, a bass player. You can play all kinds of gigs. You can do everything from, you know, and if you learn to sing, then the world really opens up to you. So I, that was my vision, man, is I bet I could make a living as an okay piano player. So I better get to work. I spent three hours or sorry, three years practicing eight or 10 hours a day, oh my living gosh. off of whatever gigs I could get. I got a little bit of help from my parents. To, I, I've lived off of some money that had been set aside for college. And from the age of 17 to 20, I basically went from pretty bad amateur piano player to capable professional piano player. Wow. And, um, didn't really see my friends for those three years. It was pretty intense, but I just loved it. And, and the thing is, I realized like I got one shot at this because if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to get a job. And there was no amount of coercion or pressure that somebody could have put on me greater than that. So I did it. I pulled it off. I ended up actually, even though I dropped out of high school, I got into the music program at university of Houston as a piano player, hmm. uh, it took me six semesters of auditioning. So every wow. semester for three years, I would go audition and they would laugh at me. Finally, I just wore them down. They let me in. I ended up getting college paid for with a full ride scholarship in, in uh, the jazz orchestra, became the first chair pianist in the jazz orchestra, spent 10 years in college. I did finish college. I actually have a degree miraculously. <laughs> Um, but I was also playing seven or eight gigs a week wow. during that time. I think that, I think one time I actually played 10 gigs in a week. It was like every day, two on Saturday, three on Sunday, you know, church, then brunch, then dinner. Um, it was intense. I even taught some piano lessons, but so I spent a decade of my twenties getting to live my dream as a bohemian musician type. I didn't have anywhere he had to be. I could say yes to gigs. I could say no to gigs. I, I, I met a lot of cool people, but I was dirt poor. Hmm. I was just dirt poor for a decade. And that sucks. Especially I grew up with pretty successful parents, you know, and they weren't about to bail me out because they, you know, that whole ask Jeeves thing. Right. So, <laughs> um, I, uh, all through my twenties, once I, once I had a few years of being poor and going, yeah, I'm probably not going to be the next, I don't know what was big back then. Like the next, uh, Backstreet Boys or Alice in Chains or whatever was big in the nineties. I'm not going to be that. So I've, I should start a business, right? Cause at least then I keep the whole independence thing. I started 10 different businesses in my twenties while I was working as a piano player. I will, we don't have enough time on wow. this episode or, or even 10 episodes to go through all those stories, but I will just say I did what a lot of people are scared to do, which is fail and then fail again and then fail again and then look stupid and then be mm. embarrassed and then get laughed at and then get mocked and get ridiculed, get divorced, fail some more get divorced again, fail some more. Like it was just bleh, the total entrepreneurial show, pardon the term. And, uh, but I was, you know, I paid the bills with music 
finally, I find myself at 29 years old, 2008. I had, I had opened two franchise restaurants. I was way too good a salesperson for my own good. I what? convinced a national U.S. <laughs> franchiser uh, that, that had just moved into the United States from Canada to give me exclusive rights to the first 10 locations in Houston, Texas, which is a big market where I was wow. from. And I op- I got the first two stores open, all with borrowed money that I convinced a banker to give to a 28-year-old kid who'd never had any success at any sort of business. And so I've got the, the franchise rights over here and, and the bank loans over here. And unfortunately, you put all that together and it's like, oh, I got to run these restaurants. <laughs> and there's like actual work to be done. Right. Selling doesn't matter without fulfillment. Yep. And then uh, 2007 was a really great time to start any business because yeah, right. the Great Recession, Morgan Stanley, Bear Stearns, or not Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, yep. like the bu- bubble burst. Long story short, 2008, I was $495,000 in debt. Over 300000 of that was to the US government because they were SBA backed loans, Small mm-hmm. Business Administration bank loans. So you don't, when you default on those, you don't, it's not the bank coming after you, it's the US Treasury. It's wow. the same thing as owing $300,000 in taxes. Jeez. So that was my life. You know, going through my second divorce, I was probably 40 pounds heavier than I am now. I, I, I was pale. I don't think I'd seen the sun in a year. I was depressed. I was living at my ex, soon to be ex wife's parents' house because I lost my apartment. And that was rock bottom. But it was also day one of becoming a pretty, you know, I guess what most people consider a good entrepreneur. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if you want to hear that story, yeah. but I figured I'd take a beat because yeah. it's your show. I'll let you talk. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. That's crazy. You know what I love about that too is just the two, two things in there. One is the commitment to becoming a professional piano player and the dedication of practicing Eight hours, to 10 hours yeah, a day for three years, for freaking three years, yeah. not seeing the sun. But then also I think the golden nugget that you mentioned is just failed 10 other businesses mm. failed again at the restaurant thing. If you call it failure, it's, it's learning ends up $500,000 in debt and you're still willing to take another chance on entrepreneurship. And I think that's a huge golden nugget for people to take or to take a realization of. It's like, look, you might have 20 failures in your life before you get the home run. So talk to us about the the success. Obviously, the next phase of the journey, you grew this $50 million worth of sales and this business. So, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, Mark Cuban says it all the time. He's like, you only got to be right once. <laughs> you know, it's like dating. Everybody, everybody thinks there's something wrong with this model. Like, oh, you fail 10 times, you get it right one time and now you're set or it changes everything. But like, isn't that what dating is? Dating is a bunch of failed relationships that hopefully culminate in one relationship that's the one. And then you get married and have kids and go on with your life, right? Like that's, I don't know why that, when that became such a terrible thing, we just live in such a, a, a comfort obsessed society that actually doesn't really know what the word comfort means because mm. comfort means with, with strength, with a fort, Con fort, your fort is meant to be a fortress of strength. Hmm. Most of us, comfort makes us soft. So, you know, whatever, the world got its brain scrambled. I just, I, I like to think that I just never drank the bad Kool Aid or I never got plugged into the Matrix or whatever metaphor you want to use. I actually think I live the way humans are supposed to live, which is like take extreme ownership of your situation. You're the most valuable asset. Don't worry about your 401k. Put your money and your time and your energy into developing yourself because eventually when you are in the right place at the right time you and you are the right person, which by the way, a lot of people are in the right place at the right time. They're just not the right person. Hmm. I did all that work in my 20s to be the right person. So suddenly I had my thing. And for me in 2008, it was digital marketing. It was learning how the internet works. It was the, you know, before language like sales funnels and conversions and you know, even they didn't even call it digital marketing back then. It was just, just, I am internet marketing, but I just really took a, a, a a liking to that and, and had some aptitude. I I always say, I just, I swapped out my piano keyboard for a computer keyboard (laughs) and, uh, did the same thing three years, eight to 10 hours a day. Although at that time it was probably more like 12 to 14 hours a day. I was living in my ex-wife's parents' house. So I didn't really want to come out of the room because I had to face them. (laughs) And I, uh, I just went, you know, balls to the wall again, forgive my, my crude language, but, uh, in 18 months I paid off that $495,000. Wow. Debt. Wow. And since then I, you know, I did affiliate marketing for five years. I did 10 million in revenue as an affiliate commissions as an affiliate marketer. Obviously I had to run ads, and spend sure. some money to do that. 
Uh, then I started a digital agency. I said, let me take these skills and sell it to small and medium sized businesses. I uh, served over 10,000 businesses in the U S and Canada, had an agency for almost six years, did about $30 million in sales, made the Inc 5,000 twice, had some other businesses in the middle, had an, I, I still have two e-com businesses. I've kind of dabbled in a lot of things, but it just all started to click. And then two years ago, I started Entre Institute, which I got to update the numbers now is over 60,000 students. Wow. Congrats. And I'm, my revenue is now over 60 million in sales. So, wow. Yeah, man. It's, it's, that, it's so, what, been you, good. what, what do you teach at Entre Institute? Like, what is that all about? Yeah, it's, it's it really, and, and Entre is a work in progress. I mean, we're evolving too. I mean, it's, it literally started with me like, finding a quiet spot with my phone and just shooting some videos to give away free value to, you know, Hey, this is what I did and kind of how I figured some stuff out, but it, it got quick traction. Uh, I figured out really quick that the more I talked about, Hey, here's the stuff you didn't learn in school. Here's how educate the education system isn't really preparing you mm -hmm. or your kids for that matter true. to yeah. contend in a, in a lot, in a world that changes so much in, in every four year span that the idea of signing up at a college, to just learn for four years without implementing or without working so that you can graduate and start something thinking that there's any validity to what you learned four years ago when you enrolled in college, like the world changes way too fast. The whole model is, is, is a farce at this mm. point, you know, within certain categories. Like if you're going to be a doctor, okay, great. Go to, <laughs> go to college. Great. But you know, the human body doesn't change every four years, but the That's economy great. does. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Um, and so I, I, the more I leaned into education, the more I found the traction. And so I said, you know what, at a certain point, somebody has got to fix this education mess. I, the, the, apparently the guy that was supposed to do it, he didn't show up. So I'll just, I'll take a stab at it. And, uh, we launched Entre Institute and it has absolutely gone nuts. We did not sell our first course until June of last year. In fact, I didn't even create the course until June of last year. I locked myself in a hotel room at the Wynn in Las Vegas, uh, and spent a week creating this course called the Entre Blueprint. That's that course by itself has sold over 60,000 units now in roughly 18 months. Wow. And it's just taken off like a rocket. I mean, our, our revenues now we're, we're, you know, right around $3 million a month now Wow. and continuing to scale. Like it's wow, just crazy. But the reality is all I did was tap into a vein of frustration, confusion, disorientation and just general awareness that like the education system is the best we have, but it's not actually good enough. Yeah. And there are so many people that want to learn how to put it together in the digital economy. I mean, Harvard tried to create a course on Facebook advertising is we're talking Harvard university. <laughs> yeah. They turned down 19 out of every 20 applicants who are willing to pay the price. Took them two years to create a Facebook <laughs> advertising course. <laughs> and by the time they launched it, the whole platform had changed. Like yeah, the world, you know, right. mainstream education just is not doing the job of teaching people about the digital economy and we're willing to do it. Well, what do you attribute the, the growth and the success uh, in that quickly to? Is it is it word of mouth? Is it your savviness in the digital marketing space that you were just able to get that many people into your funnel and buying? Yeah. I mean, we, 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 I, I wrote an ebook last or this year, I probably, I don't know, April, May, maybe June. I mean, we've had 900,000 ebook downloads in seven or eight months. Like wow. we just, we're really good digital marketers. Like that's right. the thing I think people don't realize is like, and to, and to your audience, I'll say this, like if somebody has a, let's say they have a, a real estate business, right. right? And they're, they're out there, they're going, they're, they're going to the PTO meetings at their kid's school and they're doing the Rotary Club and they're doing, the, they're part of the local BNI chapter and they're out there doing all the press in the flesh, trying to scale their business or whatever. They think, oh, I got to incorporate digital. I got to incorporate online. Like as a, it's this other thing I meant to include in my business. No, 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 no. Stop. Master digital, really master it. And because of where we are right now at this unique time in history where most of your competition has not taken the time to do that, or they, they're still thinking of it as like part of the mix, you will own your town. You will have more leads than you know what to do with. You're going to be in a completely different business a year from now if you lean into what I'm saying, where you're going to be actually training agents underneath you to field all the calls and handle all the closings. And you're just going to become a master broker earning an override if you crack lead generation on the internet. 
because it's a floodgate. There's actually no half measure that's even viable. It's kind of all or nothing and you get good at it. And you're me going, I have 900,000 book downloads in the last six months. <laughs> What's the type of ad spend that you're, you're doing, you're managing? Like, is it on Facebook? Is it on uh, YouTube, yeah. Google? Well, I mean, here's the thing. You asked me that question. I'll answer the question. It's going <laughs> to freak people out. We're running tons of Facebook and YouTube ads. Now, bear in mind, this is an election year. Yeah. This is, it's the holiday season right now. There's a lot of competition total, on Facebook. Totally cattywampus. Plus it's the year of COVID and election, you know, where the, the, the algorithms and the artificial intelligence are super crazy. intense and crazy. Yeah. Fa- plus Facebook has been purging advertisers because they had 3 million advertisers on their platform and they wanted to reduce it to 2 million. So they've just been like whacking people left and right. So this has been a really weird year for you to ask me that question. But all the, with all those qualifiers, you know, plus we're trying to scale. We're not just settling where we are. We're trying to scale 300% by next year, yeah. from, even from the clip that we're on. We spend a million bucks a month between Facebook and YouTube right now. Yeah, it's crazy. But it shows you the reason why I wanted to ask that, right, is I wanted to, you know, basically add one is this idea that if you do, like it's limitless, like we ourselves are trying to spend up to a million dollars a month ourselves. We're trying to grow our business there. Now you can't do it foolishly, right? But we're trying to get there ourselves because it is what you said. If you can put in a dollar and get $4 back, why would you not put in as much money as you possibly can? Now it doesn't scale that way is what we have found. It's not like you can just go to this magic box of Facebook and dump in (laughs) just as much money as you want. And it actually, you know, produces, Um, but talk to us a little bit about about like the strategies from a digital marketing standpoint, right? Because you're talking about real estate agents and they want to go advertise online. Um, so, you know, you want them to master that. What are some of the things they should be looking at and how do they get and actually use these platforms to their advantage? Sure. Yeah. So a couple things. One, I, I want to make it clear. Like you know, I'm playing a really big game. I'm basically taking on Harvard University, Tony Robbins. Right. Click funnels, Grant Cardone, like the Mount Rushmore of business influence and education. I'm like trying to Love that mindset, turn the tables yeah. over in the temple, right? Yep. Go back to our biblical <laughs> our metaphors. pre-show biblical so, metaphors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, like, it, it, I don't want people to hear like, "Oh, this guy spends a million dollars a month." That I could, I could never play in that league. If I'm a local real estate agent, give me a thousand dollars a month. Right. Give me two thousand dollars a month to go do some damage on Facebook. And it's like you say, once you get the funnel right, now you might spend 10 grand getting the funnel right, figuring out what the offer is, figuring out what the magical headline is for your ad, figuring out what the magical image is. And Facebook, you know, I'm using Facebook as a starting point for the conversation. There's other platforms too, but they have amazing tools that allow you to split test different images. And Facebook has these intelligent um, ad platform, I forget all the fancy words, but they'll, they'll actually tell you what creative combination works the best, where you give them five headlines, five images, five domains, five calls to action. And Facebook will just like figure out the magic ad, right? I mean, this stuff is powerful. And now you, you might be prepared. And the problem is people go, Oh, I spent a thousand dollars on Facebook ads and it didn't work. You know what? Right. I spent a hundred thousand dollars on Facebook ads and it didn't work Right. (laughs) until it did. Right. (laughs) You just, and you know, I'm the guy that failed 10 times and doesn't stop. That's, that's why I'm able to scale. It's not because I know something someone else doesn't know. I probably know something they don't know now, but it's less, it's hard won lessons from lots of failures. So to the real estate agent, I mean, I have a buddy that's doing this right now in a, in one of the best real estate markets in the United States. He, he runs ads online. He came up with a, um, a really, really effective model for, mixing offline and online where he goes out and he knocks doors. He, you know, he does the canvassing yep. thing, right? And he, he does a lot of the, the grassroots stuff, but he also goes online and targets those zip codes so that the people whose doors he knocked also see him online and they'll go into his funnel for a free, you know, I don't want to over reveal what his offer is, but I mean, it's a, you know, market analysis, consultation, sure thinking about selling your home, I'll come do a listing analysis kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's just cleaning up. He just hired his 10th agent 
underneath him. Yeah, geez. He do you do a yeah. do, do you do a lot of uh, retargeting? So in your funnels, oh, yeah. right? So oh, yeah. do you find that it's the retargeting that's actually making the big difference for you um, when you're actually running these ads? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the way the economics work out, and then remind me, there's something else I really, really want to say that is almost it's a, it's a very rarely discussed, but essential piece of the conversation. So just remind okay. me that I've got another big thing I want to say, but, but let me answer your retargeting question. So yeah, hundred percent. A lot of times the way the economics work out, somebody will go spend, let's say a thousand dollars on Facebook ads and they'll get one, one sale. Let's say they get a $400 sale of XYZ widget. And they're like, Oh, this sucks. I, I'm losing money. What they don't realize is if they did it right, they've, let's say uh, with those thousand dollars, they got 200 leads onto a list. And then of those, only one person bought the $400 thing. Well, if they run retargeting ads to those 200 people, they can, they could set a $10 a day retargeting. Actually for 200 people, they probably set a $4 a day retargeting budget yeah. and follow those people all around and probably get two more sales. For very, well, now very instead expensive. of a thousand dollars making $400, let's say they did that for a month at $4 a day, you've got $1,120 now produce $1,200. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more sophisticated use of the platform. And so a lot of people go, well, let me get the, let me get my main funnel working and then I'll add in retargeting. And that's like only putting half the numbers into the equation and expecting the math to work. Mm -hmm. You got to do retargeting. All right. I got one more question. Then let's go back to the other big thing is, do okay. you find video ads are working better for you or image based ads? So, I mean, the general, the conventional wisdom is yes, video is the highest consumption media online. And generally I would agree, but, but with, a, with an asterisk, video is the best if, if you can be passably good on video. <laughs> okay. Some people, but if you're not passably good on video, then it's actually the worst because all people are going to be thinking is this is the worst video I've ever seen. They're not even listening to what you're mm. saying. So like, you know, and by the way, and that's not like a static, you know, truth about you. It just means you, maybe you need to practice. Maybe you need to get some reps in, make it so you're not constantly looking up. Like if you write a script and you put it on the wall and then you put your camera here and your eyes keep darting up and you like your head's <laughs> we, We've all and, seen them. We've all yeah, seen them. I mean, it takes practice. I spent, I spent, you know, what, I don't know, 10, 11,000 hours in three years getting good enough to get hired for one piano gig where they paid me with a plate of food. Like, no, you're so right. I mean, takes, so many people think that that's, that it's natural, right? So these people have natural <laughs> charisma, so they're just doing it. And it's just like this podcast. Like we sucked when we started this podcast. We really did. We were so <laughs> awkward and stiff. And it's like, but no, after practice, after doing these videos over and over again, you watch them back, you force yourself to watch them back because you really don't want to watch them back. You, cringe you a don't want to listen to them and you just keep doing it. It's, it's practicing the piano for eight hours a day. Yeah. And what? once you get good enough, then video is, is absolutely what you should do, especially for realtors. I mean, I, since we happen to be talking about that niche. What do you think about, like, I think this is true, but I haven't proven it out, but it's more of a gut feeling is the same is true on the flip side of too good. Like if your ad is too good, if it's too overproduced, yeah. if it's too polished, like we find in our ads, it's like those don't get high engagement because of, I don't know what you call it, ad blindness or whatever. But do you find that the same for what you're doing? Yeah, I, I actually, I mean, yes, again, with a qualifier, I don't think it's as much about production value because my best ad, best converting ad right now online is probably my best produced ad right now. Okay, it's nice, like, nice. it's got drone footage of me driving my, my, uh, off-road vehicle. My ORV is Can-Am like in the hills behind my house. Okay, Maybe like, we're just not producing dirt. at that level. That's no, what, that's what here's the thing. <laughs> no, but here's, here's the, here's the point if production value becomes an offset for a lack of authenticity and a lack of real connection, then it becomes a problem. If you, if you're really like, I'm, I've just, I've developed the skill. I also did theater for a while. I've, I've probably shot a thousand videos in the last two and a half years. Wow. I'm pretty good. I mean, I'll do it in my computer. I'm pretty good at looking you in the eyes and be like, my name is Jeff Lerner. Did you know that over 1,700 new millionaires are being created in the United States every single day right now? And that's over 4,000 worldwide. You know, like I just, I don't know, man. I just have this character I go into yep. where it's like, hey, this guy's real. He's believable. And then you can put all the, all the, you, know you, know, you can produce avatar. You know, you can put avatar too. around. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but but the ads are good. I mean, at the end of the day, just the ads are good. I don't know what else to say. And if you if but they're good because I'm pretty real. That's the one thing people I get the yeah, most feedback. Like Jeff just seemed like he seemed like the real guy out of all these internet guys talking about business and entrepreneurship and how to make more money and all that. He just seemed like the one that was real. And I think if you pull that off, well, I also don't want you. I also want to point out because I think you're saying this without without saying it is you've tested all of those. So you know what lines oh. draw people in. And this is what I want to make sure everyone else is, is thinking about whenever they're spending that thousand dollars that they feel like they're wasting. That is if you're, if you're doing it intentionally and you're looking at what is working, what's getting the, the engagement and you're then amplifying mm-hmm. your, uh, your either delivery of that, right? The amount of money you're spending on that specific ad or creative, or you are taking that and continuing to build upon it. Like we do the same thing on our webinars. We'll recognize, okay, someone re- like the audience really latched onto that, yep. to that point or really latched yeah. onto that hook point or that value proposition. And then we'll just continue to build onto that. And if you're yep. doing it that way, you're not wasting money. You're actually learning what you've learned over the last 20 years, however long. I, I couldn't agree more. And somebody put it in a way that I think really sums it up. They said, you're not pay- any advertising platform. You're not paying for customers. You're not paying for leads. You're paying for data. And if you're getting useful data back, you're not wasting your money. Mm. You just might be ignorant about what to do with the that's data. That's great. Yeah. That's your fault, not Facebook's fault. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right, go back to the big point. Yeah. Okay. So the big point is, this is another reason why even through... October and, you know, September, October, November of 2020, which were by far the three most brutal months in in the history of online advertising for all the reasons I discussed earlier. It's just kind of a perfect storm. I'm sure next year will be even worse, but every year it gets harder. Here's why we continue to to do so well. I have, I spend about 20% of my creation time, probably less now, maybe five or 10%, focusing on paid ads. And I spend 80 to 90% of my time focusing on creating free high value content that tells the world who I am, what I know, and how much I deeply wish to serve. Mm. And so people see one of my ads, they're no dummy. They go to, they go do some research, right? Mm -hmm. And they go to my YouTube channel and they see this guy's got 400 videos of free trainings. They go to my Facebook page. They go, this guy's got 700 videos of free trainings. They go to m- my Millionaire Secrets podcast. They go, oh, this guy's only been having had a podcast for eight months. And he's already produced 100 episodes mm. of great interviews with great people. Like this guy is clearly obsessed with delivering value. And then they listen to all my messages. And I don't talk about how to market on... Fa- I mean, I teach some stuff, but I talk about all kinds of stuff. How how being an entrepreneur can help you be a better dad and be a better parent, be a better husband and how the same thing that will help you close more sales will also help you listen more responsibly when your wife comes home after a bad day. And, and I weave it into my life and everything. I mean, I have my, my vlog camera right next to me all the time. Like I'm obsessed with creating content that truly serves. Like after years and years of talking about service, I finally actually decided to do it in a way that is without expectation of a result. Mm. I, I only want to serve, yeah. not I serve as long as it converts. It's like, no, I'll serve. I'll, I'll make videos and I don't care if anybody even sees them. If I know it was good, I'll know that one day, one person that needs that piece of information will see it and it'll have done its job. And since I've started doing that, guys, I acquire customers on Facebook for a third of what my competition does because there's like, I like this guy because he's trying so hard to add value to the world. That's the non-negotiable. That's how you game the system. It's not by, you can only optimize paid advertising to a point because at some point Facebook goes, we're not going to let you get more efficient because we yeah. actually want your money. <laughs> but you but you can win the war on the back end of that advertising by with, with a preponderance of value-based content that does what's called persuasion, which is persuasion before the offer. Mm-hmm. That's so good, yeah. That's yeah. why I went. Do, do you find that... Um, in that type, like taking that type of content and then using that as your paid, there's no call to action. There's no, you're not trying to push them anywhere. It is literally like I'm even spending my own money to get free value out in front of you. Do you find that works as well? Um, so I am, I'm literally giving you like 
the the realization of like two million dollars worth of split testing and, and <laughs> hacking at our and our that's own, why we love stay account. paid baby so, yeah now here it is use the free content for, put it all out there so that people that see your ads and go do the research they see it but then if you want to spend money on it spend money on it for retargeting ads yeah because you get views and clicks so much cheaper with retargeting ads and think about it somebody sees your ad they're like yeah i don't know but then they see five more of your free content videos that had no call to action. And then they see your ad again. First of all, they think you're everywhere. Second of all, now they like you. Now they list, now they trust you because you gave them something before you asked for something. It becomes a lot more likely to convert on the second ad if they've seen your content in between. So we use content for retargeting ads. Yeah. What's so the good. next big platform that nobody's using yet? Well, if I honestly, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you, but <laughs> I think that that's we've gotten all, we got all we can get out. Yeah. Wait, what about the service? Well, well everyone's, you're here everyone's saying <laughs> like like Facebook was was so big, and it still is. Obviously, it's huge, huge for digital marketing. YouTube, I'm hearing a lot. Like people aren't using YouTube enough. It's still it's still very cheap. You know. Then you've got all the yeah, other ones. I, I will TikTok? say this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, I'll say that. Look, like I'm a Facebook and YouTube guy. Uh, TikTok. You know, we've got it in our 21 strategy to, to build a strategy around TikTok. I mean, there's no wrong platform, really. I mean, there's people that crush it with Twitter. There's people that crush it with LinkedIn. But here's what I'll say. Facebook overplayed their hands. They became really, really difficult to work with as an advertiser. And YouTube, which used to be the, the heavy-handed one, Google used to be really heavy-handed on like compliance. And we don't like your offer. And we don't like your phrasing. And we don't like your image. And you know, you, we think you can see one sixteenth of a nipple and you're really, you're like, no, it's a birthmark. I swear. And like, we don't care. You can't run the ad. And like, they used to be really hard to deal with, but, um, Facebook overplayed their hand and Google was like, Oh, there's opportunity. We'll be, we'll be the nice guys again. And they became really easy to work, a lot easier to work with. And that's why YouTube is now so popular. But listen, I mean, those are both platforms where you have trillions of impressions to work with. I don't know why somebody's like, I got to go master TikTok. I mean, I get it, but here's my, the strategy I just gave you of like leading with service, leading with value, building up a, a base of content that is so big and so high value that it just dominates all skepticism. That's really what it and is. It can like go people anywhere. Go, I don't know about, what? Yeah, I don't know about this Jeff guy, but then they go see my YouTube channel yeah. and there's no more not knowing about this Jeff guy. Yeah. There's just not. And which means I can make any platform work. Right, right, right. Because I win the persuasion game. And I'd rather focus on that than trying to hack, you know, have a crystal ball and, and you know, pick apart everything Gary Vee says to figure out what the next trend is going to be. Yeah, I love that. Mm, that's so good. All right, man. So we got to ask you this because we ask this to every guest that comes on is you're, you're successful. Okay. You have walked through a lot of failure to get to the successes that you've had. And we are junkies for self-development. I'm wondering, do you have any routines that you've implemented in your life that have driven success for you? <laughs> okay, this is got, this got really weird. No. <laughs> I love the question. <laughs> Routines. All I am is a routine. Give me a break. There is nothing <laughs> original or sexy or fun or cool or creative about my life except the results. Results are a lot more fun than trying to entertain yourself in the meantime. I'm all routine. I wake up at 3.30 every morning. Jeez. I have one hour of prep where I listen to audiobooks. I put together my little baggie of all my supplements for the day. I make my coffee. I go to the gym. I'm at the gym by 4.30. I work out for six, 45 or 60 minutes, depending on the day. I have a seven-day split that never changes. I never take a day off. Take five minutes to jog to my office, practice the piano for 60 minutes, have to jog back to the gym, get in my car, go straight home, take my daughter to the bus stop, go back home, see my other daughter get up and my other boys off to school. And then I'm back at the office by 8 a.m. My mornings are all, I mean, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all have a specific breakdown. Mondays and Tuesdays are management calls in the mornings. Wednesdays and thirties, Thursdays are creation in the mornings. Fridays, I block off the whole day for producing content videos. Afternoons are equally structured. Saturdays, I work a half day. Sundays, I don't work. It's, it's mer merciless, my routine. And it's oh, well, how I, it's why yeah. I, it's why I get the question, how do you get so much done? Cause I don't waste time <laughs> and I don't, and I have eliminated 
decisions. I make so few decisions because I decided once what I wanted my schedule to look like instead of having to decide every hour. So what should I do? That's powerful. Yeah, that is powerful. I think you might have won the award there for like, yeah, the routine. Yeah. And you well, first of all, you, you, you wake up the earliest. So we've, we've had a lot of, a lot of people say they get up early, a lot of five thirties, a lot of four thirties. Yep. First three thirty. Yeah, you are <laughs> the first. Here's the thing: 30, 30. by six, or, by six or seven every day, it's not like I don't get to relax. By but usually by seven every day, I'm home. I'm hanging out with my wife. I have teenage boys. They have teenage friends. There's always like ten teenagers at my house, and I'm like the cool dad. Like we go hang out. We watch them on the we have a half pipe in our backyard. We watch them on the half pipe. I watch some TV at night with Jacqueline. Like, but it's like I, I have to earn that every day. I yeah. get an hour or two of that yeah. for a day well done, yep. you know? Yep. That's awesome. All right. What advice would you go back and tell your younger self, high school age kid? Structure is your friend. Mm. Get over it. Being creative doesn't mean being some degenerate drifter in the wind. And stop hiding, stop hiding behind being an artist for being unscheduled. Mm. That was a golden nugget, ladies and gentlemen. That is the pain that. of the creative world. It is. It is. Yeah. And a lot of musicians become marketers because you were a musician, I was a musician. Yeah. A lot of musicians become well, We marketers. talked about it in a po- podcast and yeah. we recorded one of our, just uh, not a guest one, about the creative habit. And Twyla Tharp wrote kind of a book about that, how yeah. it's all structured. It's, it's all structured. And the more that you can structure it's it, the, the more creativity uh, will come. Yeah, yeah. Work, work the muscle. That's no, awesome. That's awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Before we close out, let people know how they can connect with you. I know you've got a special link that you want to give out today. Yeah, come come check out uh, millionairesecrets.com forward slash stay paid. We put together a landing page just for this episode and to kind of acknowledge you guys for having me on. And there's three things you can do there. One, you can get my my uh, ebook. We're, we're racing to a million downloads. So we'd love to have you be one of them. Um, nice. and, uh, you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, see what those 400 videos are all about. And, you know, by next year, it'll be 500. Like I'm committed. I want my YouTube channel to actually be able to produce a more direct measurable financial result for someone for free than a four-year Harvard education. That's my goal. So Love that. come check out my YouTube channel. And then also you can subscribe to my podcast, the Millionaire Secrets Podcast. And you can get all of those links at uh, millionairesecrets.com slash stay paid. We'll also link to that over uh, the show notes for this episode. If you get lost, you can't remember what that link was, head on over to staypaidpodcast.com. We'll have the link to that in our show notes. Thank you so much for listening. If you're looking for ways to support the show, there's two, there's going to be three ways. First way is to head on over to millionairesecrets.com slash stay paid. Let Jeff know that you saw or that you heard him on this show. Uh, another way is is to leave a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, shoot us a review, and then make sure you're telling a friend about this episode. Uh, if you want to get hold of me or Luke directly, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com and you can connect with us on Instagram. We are at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Aker. And what a great episode, man. Talk about overcoming failure time and time again, commitment, going all in on something. But I think the action item that you should take advantage of if you're not already is you need to implement retargeting in your Facebook advertising. Like that is something that is not very hard to do, even though it sounds overwhelming. In fact, if you're a client of Reminder Media, we actually teach you these type of things. Uh, So, and I know this is stuff that you need to implement in your business. And so guys, take action on retargeting on Facebook figure it out, go and check out Jeff's stuff. He can probably help you on his 400 YouTube videos. Remember this, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer is top producers take action. Take action on that today. 